role of the Department of Health. Her office plays a vital role in reintegrating the COVID-19 surveillance into the epidemiology bureau with the hope of um, replicating the data management and analytics innovations for the other epidemiology bureau managed disease surveillance systems. So colleagues to talk to us on the importance of surveillance in the control of vaccine preventable diseases. Let's all welcome Dr. Thea de Guzman. Morning for uh, I can just set things up a bit. So let me start by thanking um, on behalf of the Epidemiology Bureau the invitation um, to share you know, um, for us and for MIMA. The passion really is to promote epidemiology and surveillance and how crucial it is in the prevention and control of um, a lot of uh, not just communicable but non-communicable diseases. Let me start with this caricature entitled Death's Dispensary, which was published during the London cholera outbreak in the 1800s in a response to the hypothesis of the English epidemiologist John Snow, who linked the cholera epidemic with sewage sipping into the groundwater used for drinking. At that time, as you'll see on the advisory on the right, the disease was actually attributed to miasma. And advisories included advice on temperance on eating and drinking rather than ensuring safe water access. After another large cholera outbreak in London, John Snow took it upon himself to monitor cases and deaths daily through house-to-house -house visits. And from these created a map that led him to theorize that the Broad Street pump was a probable cause of the disease as cases clustered around that area and much lower numbers were detected among those who did not use that pump. It was by introducing these new epidemiologic methods of using systematic methods to prove a hypothesis, collect evidence to support said hypothesis, and provide recommendations based on said evidence that John Snow was named the father of modern epidemiology. These are the same methods we use now in conducting surveillance for, this, for diseases and public health issues whose stories, unfortunately, mostly remain the same to this date. So what is public health surveillance? It is the collective analysis, is this the collection analysis, interpretation, and dissemination of data to an ongoing and systematic approach to identify signals that will trigger public health actions aimed at reducing morbidity and mortality and improving health. We use it to describe the burden of disease or the potential for disease and to monitor trends and patterns of disease risk factors and the agents causing these diseases. It is also to detect sudden changes in disease occurrence and distribution and provide data for programs, policies, and priorities. And lastly, to evaluate our prevention and control efforts. In the Philippines, the Epidemiology Bureau leads the establishment and enhancement of public health surveillance systems it is mandated to provide and promote the use of epidemiologic information for evidence-based decision-making through our surveillance and information systems and by strengthening epidemiology and surveillance capacities across all levels of health. One of the surveillance systems established in our country is the Philippine Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response, or PIDSAR, which was established in 2007. And this was following the 2005 International Health Regulations Call for Stronger Systems on Epidemiology, Surveillance, and Response. And in 2021, in support of RA-11223, or the Universal Health Care Act, as well as RA-11332, or the Mandatory Reporting of Notifiable Diseases, PIDSAR was enhanced to integrate both indicator 
and ev event-based surveillance under one program. These systems were intended to complement each other and detect signals that will trigger response. These are the notifiable diseases under PIDSAR, and these are divided into four clusters, one of which is our vaccine-preventable diseases, which include the monitoring of acute flaxseed paralysis, which is our proxy for polio, diphtheria, measles, rubella, non-neonatal tetanus, neonatal tetanus, as well as pertussis. Related to the purpose of surveillance we mentioned earlier, these are the specific objectives of our VPD surveillance. It's to monitor disease elimination through detection of all cases, as well as determination of risk factors, the detection of outbreaks and new pathogens by identifying clusters any and any unusual or rare, rare strains, to gather evidence for new vaccine introduction or to optimize vaccine schedules by updating VPD epidemiology trends and disease burden. Also, to evaluate the immunization program performance by characterizing gaps in our immunization program as well as the epidemiologic patterns of cases. We also would like to determine vaccine effectiveness and the impact on disease burden by looking at these trends, pre and post vaccine introduction. And lastly, to identify changes in disease strains or types through molecular or serologic characterization of cases. Under existing policies, VPT cases are detect that are detected by our disease reporting units must follow standard case definitions and must be reported to the next higher level epidemiology and surveillance unit or ESU within 24 hours by the fastest means possible. Case investigation forms or CIF and or case report forms or CRFs are actually used in our reporting. These um, data are encoded into what is now our epidemic prone disease case surveillance information system which is an online system or still the offline PITSAR software. So we're now in transitioning from offline to offline to online systems. These encoded data are then validated. We also follow a daily zero case reporting so that we minimize missing cases and also to flag as soon as possible if there are ESO functionality issues. Why are we then putting a lot of emphasis on surveillance? This slide shows the global goals for VPD eradication, elimination, and control. And we can see that this is measured no, by achieving set numbers of either reaching a zero incidence or a very low incidence or number of measles, neonatal tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Let us more um, closely look at our poly eradication efforts and then the other um, status of the other VPDs nationally. The last wild polio in the Philippines was actually in 1993 and it was detected in Cebu. And it was in 2000 that the Philippines was certified polio free along with other countries in the Western Pacific region. So, Pag nag-declare po ng polyfree, it is as a region. So if there is one country in that region that is not polyfree, the whole region loses its polyfree certification. However, a few months after certification, the risk of emergence of circulating VDPVs became imminent. In the Philippines, there were three circulating VDPV cases reported from the provinces of Cavite, Laguna and Misamis Oriental. And this was also what was seen in countries no? in the Western Pacific and even in the Seattle region. And as such, the Emergency Committee under the IHR in 2014 stated that the spread of polio, whether wild or vaccine derived, is a public health emergency of international concern. And it was necessary for us to take actions to interrupt the spread of these poliovirus. This statement is actually valid as of the state at hindi pa po nalilift yung declaration na yon. 
despite having those detections of CVDPV as soon as we were declared polyfree, a decade actually passed without us detecting additional VTPVs and we were able to maintain our polyfree status. However, we were not able to consistently reach our non-polio AFP rate and we fell below the target of at least one per 100,000, which was set by WHO. This target ensures that our surveillance is sensitive enough to detect polio cases. There was a detection of an ambiguous VDPV in 2014 in South Cotabato, and our readiness was tested. We strengthened surveillance and expanded it to include environmental sampling for, for, from wastewater. And it was also at this time that we switched no, from trivalent to bivalent OPV, and we also conducted catch-up and supplemental immunization. Despite, however, this supplemental immunization, and as presented by Dr. Kimpat earlier, we remained at risk. No? In 2018, we had a very low OPV3 coverage only reaching at 66%. So gusto natin po 95 sana. And so the following year, on July 1, 2019, an environmental sample collected from Tondo, Manila, tested positive for VDPV type 1. And additional water samples were collected in the same site on three different dates. And these additional samples showed positive for VDPV1. Further, VDPV2 was also isolated from a sample collected on August 13. So one muna bago po naging two. There were also additional samples from Davao City and Legarda, which now tested for B VDPV2. All of these environmental sample detections were followed by intensive case finding and expansion of our wastewater surveillance. Despite these efforts, it was interesting that we never found a human case of polio in Manila as well as in Davao City. It will be on September 16 that an AFP case from Lanao del Sur reported through routine surveillance would test positive for VDPV2. This case was linked with the previously isolated VDPV2 from environmental surveillance. And in September 24 days later, an AFP case from Laguna also tested positive from VTPV2. Thus, after 19 years of being polio free, the Philippines declared a polio outbreak after isolation of both human and environmental samples. We detected 29 more polio infected children in addition to these two cases. 17 actually presented with acute flaxseed paralysis but the rest were healthy children, which we identified through a healthy child, healthy children survey, as well as contact tracing no? after collecting, investigating and collecting samples through our FETP fellows. The illustrations are actually color coded and these are based on how they're linked. No? They're usually linked either by their place, and, but it was interesting that we have um, human cases actually linked to environmental samples coming from Manila. So that's how mobile our population is. And we know that there's actually um, uh, an area in Manila where a lot no, of our kapatid from Mindanao come at naninirahan po doon. So it was interesting how they were linked, however far they are. And it was also during this outbreak that we actually detected an immunodeficiency related VDPV case. And um, to this date, no, this child's recovery remains very challenging kasi nag-shed pa rin po no, ang ating IVDPV case. This outbreak called for new surveillance strategies involving house-to-house -house survey to detect children with AFP that could be tested for polio, even in far-flung areas where epidemiology, surveillance, and laboratory capacities and access were very limited. This polio outbreak also provided an opportunity to highlight, highlight how a One Health approach through strong collaboration of health with environment could be utilized in surveillance. Every confirmed case was thoroughly investigated through our FETP fellows and ESU staff 
regions were provided funding to support to hire AFP surveillance officers or APSOS who were trained or on the updated guidelines. And there were regular meetings conducted, no? Parang natatandaan ko po, kung hindi daily, nagwi-weekly meeting po, even with our WHO counterparts. Because of these, the evidence generated through strengthened surveillance, these guided public health actions, including preventive supplemental immunization activities, outbreak investigations and response immunizations, and that led to the closure of the polio outbreak in the country in June of 2021. However, despite the end of this polio outbreak, we remain at high risk for VPD outbreaks. In 2022, VPD cases were higher than in 2021. And while this may be primarily attributed to improved surveillance as we allocate more resources to non-COVID efforts in 2022, it is also a reflection of the negative impact of COVID on our routine immunization whose coverages have been on a decline since 2019, then markedly declined since 2020. Let me start with our AFP data. From January to November 12, uh, 12, we have detected 746 AFP cases. There were 17 deaths with a CFR of 2.5%. 41% of these are children aged under 5, and we have 30 or 4% who were not vaccinated with any polio vaccine. Of these, we have already classified no, 87%. We still have this 94 cases pending classification kung sila po ba ay non-polio AFP or not po. So, these are actually our surveillance indicators. Our annualized non-polio AFP rate is now at 2.63. It is slightly above the target set by WHO of 2. Aside from this, the AFP reporting rate was also achieved nationally at 2.3. However, while we are, seem to be doing well in looking for cases, it must be noted that our stool adequacy rate is still below the 80% no, na tina-target po natin, along with eight other regions. And I guess for me, striking was Calabarzon, no? na siya na yung pinakamalaking region, siya na rin ang pinakamalapit sa NCR where we have our National Reference Laboratory, pero it actually had the lowest stool adequacy rate of only 44%. So siya yung kaisa-isang red po doon sa lahat ng regions natin. So again, so these are much better than what we saw in 2019, but given that we're seeing red and yellows here, means that there is much to be improved on so that we feel confident that we are detecting enough so that we can maintain our polio-free status. Going on to our measles rubella situation, as of November 12, we have detected 572 measles rubella cases, which is higher by 172% versus 2021. It's still a very low number, no? May small peak lang po tayo ng August 22. But these red lines are actually representing what we call epidemic thresholds, meaning based on a five-year data, ganito lang dapat karami yung ine-expect naming measles rubella. And we have actually slightly exceeded these alert and um, epidemic thresholds. So 63% remain to be those aged under five. So since I think the middle of the year, we have been flagging that there's a possibility of another wide-scale measles outbreak. And these are what we observe based on our historical data. Number one, palagi pong sinusundan ng mababang coverages ang mga wide-scale um, outbreaks. Ikalawa, hindi lamang pagtaas ng kaso ang nakikita natin. Unfortunately, there's also a proportional increase in the deaths observed during these outbreaks. Here, we only had three deaths in 2016. But we can see by 2018, no, at the end of the year when cases started to increase, these deaths increased to 341. And during the peak of the outbreak in 2019, we recorded 637 deaths or a 1.3% case fatality rate. And 89% of these deaths 
were among those aged under five years. So we don't want that to happen again. Rubella has also been detected no, with a total of 48 laboratory confirmed cases to date. This is also higher at 37% compared to last year. So what are we flagging when it comes to rubella? This is a graph showing the distribution by age group of these confirmed rubella cases. What have we observed? In 2009, those aged under 15 years only comprised 34% of confirmed rubella cases. These are those colored yellow, blue, and orange. However, we have seen a reversal of this trend with those aged 15 years and above now comprising 92% in 2020. The change in 2021 and 2022 may be due to some surveillance and laboratory testing issues he faced during the pandemic. Pero siguro had our surveillance been as good, ganito pa rin yung trend natin. We also observed the same trend among females were those from the childbearing age of 15 to 49 years only comprised 65% of cases in 2019, then jumped to 92% in 2020. This is a concern because the increasing number of males of childbearing age being affected with rubella also means increasing the risk of their children developing congenital rubella syndrome. So we don't have a CRS surveillance now, but this is one of the goals of the Epidemiology Bureau for 2023. I'll not dwell on this, rather saying again what Kim Pat said, and just look into this. So kung kanina po, konti lang yung yellow at red sa AFP, mas marami pong pula at yellow sa ating measles rubella surveillance indicators. So we have six, and we were able to achieve three. No? So what have we achieved? We were able to achieve targets for the national suspect measles reporting rate. We're also able to achieve no, yung ating timeliness and adequacy of specimen collection, as well as the annualized suspect reporting rate. It means that we're able to find cases. No? Our surveillance is good enough to detect suspect cases. But where did we fall? No? The timeliness and adequacy of our case investigation, meaning nahanap nga, pero ang tagal bago maimbestigahan, ang tagal bago po ma-report. And also, hindi tayo pumasok doon sa gano'ng kalaking rate yung non measles rubella. So hindi sapat na nakita mo siya, pero you should be able to confirm that these are really not measles or rubella cases. So, Ibig sabihin, it is a reflection that number one, our laboratory specimen collection from our disease reporting units has a lot to be improved on. And it's also a reflection na napaka-centralized pa po kasi, no? We only have one NRL and it's here in Manila. So um, the approach really is to expand uh, and to have subnational capacity so that there is better access for confirmatory testing not just for measles rubella, but for all of the other VPDs. Just looking at our diphtheria cases, we have now detected 61 cases, also 53% higher. This is another reflection of how we need to expand our confirmatory capacities because all of these cases are actually just probable cases, meaning nagpasok sila sa clinical classification but they weren't tested. So, hindi talaga tayo sigurado kung confirmed or not sila ng mga diphtheria cases. And lastly, uh, and second to the last is pertussis. No? We now have 29 cases, which is 26% higher. Again, most of these are actually suspect cases and not confirmed. Of uh, these, there were three who received two or more doses of the vaccine, but there were two na nabigyan lamang ng iisang dose. And lastly is NT. I think this is, I guess, sad no? that we're still detecting uh, neonatal tetanus. It is 173% higher than in 2011 uh, than in 2021. And I guess even for me, what was surprising is that the 11 regions where we detected neonatal tetanus includes the national capital region where we have the best no? and easiest access to birthing centers and hospitals. 
we also have a CFR of 22%. No? So um, that's something we really need to, to work on. So again, we're able to detect, but there's still a lot of gaps no, in our surveillance system. Um, one of our, I guess, credo in the Epidemiology Bureau is being very honest and frank that there's still a lot to work on. I'll not go through so much, but this slide just summarizes the findings and recommendations of an evaluation done by WHO. And it highlighted that while the system has been established across levels and we have very committed staff, our epidemiology and surveillance units lack the needed investments on building staff capacities, IT infrastructure, and this has led to delays in reporting. We need more efficient data management systems coupled with a shift to Sentinel-based surveillance that shall improve data quality. I'd just like to add, since those here are from the medical field and associations, and we'd like to share what we have observed. Bakit ba tayo nahihirapan ding maghanap, no? At mag-confirm. I think nung isang outbreak ng measles, isang finding nila, hindi na alam ng mga bagong doktor ano ba ang measles. Kasi nga sobrang kaunti. So parang akala ba nila, nakita namin kadalasan, viral exantem. No? So parang napaka-vague na mga diagnosis. So we really need, need to make our doctors, our healthcare workers, more familiar with this VPDs. Kahit nung time ko po, parang isang diphtheria lang po ata ang nakita ko sa PGH. No? So how do we expose them to that? It also has to be admitted that we really have very limited network, no? ang ating ESU, to our own clinical practitioners, to our private health facilities, and even the non-healthcare na mga settings like schools and workplaces. We're really strong doon sa public health infrastructure, pero doon sa outside of that network, we need to better engage them. So, hindi kabisado or hindi familiar ano bang case definition. So, we argue between what's surveillance and what's diagnosis. Anong gagamitin na CIF or CRF? Saan ba at anong samples ang kokolektahin? Paano nila ipadadala so that they can be confirmed? Sometimes, there's also little partnership between clinical practitioners and the local government units who are doing the outbreak investigations. And admittedly, there's also limited feedback no, from our end to our clinical practitioners in the private sector. So it's also a call no, for us to engage more specialists who will compose so, si, Mary, si Doc Mary Ann is a po, our expert group. So tatanda ko si Doc Aida Salonga, ang tagal-tagal-tagal na po sa, sa polio, si Doc Nina. So we need, I guess, new blood kasi eventually they will retire, no? So we need more specialists who will ho hopefully comprise our AFP and measles rubella expert panels. And we still have our national and regional AFI committees, no? Now very crucial for our causality assessment. So what now do we and should we expect moving forward? So una, kailangan po namin palakasin yung tinatawag namin indicator or case-based surveillance. So, I mentioned earlier sentinel sites. So, ibig bang sabihin, hindi na po lahat magpapadala? No. We still need to send all of this data. It's just that we're looking at how sentinel surveillance can make our processes more efficient so that mas kaunti yung mas aalagaan at yung datos natin ay mas dekalidad. No? We also are shifting to an online information system. Dati po kasi nagpapadala pa yan ng mga files na manually naming kino-consolidate. So that means we also need to make data management more efficient. Where we were only used to managing thousands to at most hundreds of thousands of records, COVID taught us to manage millions. And with Kimpat, hundreds of millions of vaccination data. There's also increased, uh, there's also a need to increase the relevance and utility for data. I remember Sinad, um, ang aming RCC parang sa misas, ito lang ba talagang mapaproduce nyo EB? So kami naman, we're up to the challenge of being able to produce data that will be of use to our decision makers. And we'd also like to increase transparency of our access. And we are planning to have public trackers available at our DOH website. Now, hindi lang po yung statistical report, but 
kikita po nila. We also need to strengthen our event-based surveillance. No? Don't po kami nakakahanap ng clusters and unusual events. And it's really our early warning system. And as I've mentioned earlier, to really expand our laboratory and confirmatory capacity and sequencing. I wasn't familiar with the value of sequencing, but COVID taught us that there's much you can do with sequencing. No? So we just need to get our act together para hindi lang makapag-sequence, pero we really use the sequence data we have right now. And lastly is the commitment of the Epidemiology Bureau to serve as a center that will consolidate this epidemiological and health-related data so that when I tell you a country's situation, it will be something that will be of uh, big use no, sa ating lahat. So I'll not go through so much. It's just that we have a vision of what public health surveillance should be. It should be multi-source. At the start of COVID, I was very adamant that I should only be analyzing data coming from my surveillance system, only to realize, and nakikita ko si Doc Anna, and it is because of the feedback of our experts and groups telling us that no, sino pa ba ang gagawa niyan? Sino pa ba ang magsasama-sama ng iba't ibang datos kung hindi kayo? So we need to expand yung sources namin para din buo yung picture na ibibigay namin sa inyo. We need to digitally transform. I guess I don't want the pandemic, but thank you to the pandemic. But because of it, we now had a lot of investment on, an, on our information system. Sa tingin ko, kung wala yung pandemic, we're still manual. No? And I think the last is uh, being action-oriented. We were really, um, our reports have been very routine. But now we know that there are changing expectations and the Epidemiolo Epidemiology Bureau should be able to meet no, those expectations. And that means a lot of balancing yung kumpleto siya, pero sapat lang siya para makapag uh, bigay tayo ng sapat na response. So I'd like to um, end by thanking our partners. No? Hindi naman po talaga mangyayari to kung kami lang. No? It was our development partners, it was our ESO family, it was our clinicians and practitioners and our medical associations. Had it not been for that, the polio outbreak wouldn't have ended, no? And wouldn't be making great strides toward eliminating this BPD. So this is the end. Our key message is, is we really look onto surveillance, no? Um, I just came from a global health security agenda meeting and we talk about health security and I don't know how to close that. Yeah. So we need to keep our secure. We're not just monitoring what's going on now. Part of it is looking into the future and what could be possible health threats. And I guess yung how do we look for these early signals so that we can be better prepared. The COVID-19 pandemic and all of these previous outbreaks taught us that we need to invest on quality surveillance because it will provide us the critical information we need to guide strategies and response. And last is how a strong surveillance network will also require an equally strong, well-coordinated network of equally capacitated units and partners. So with that, thank you very much. And again, a good day to all.